All right, turn your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 6. There's a conversation that will always be uh, significant to me in understanding generational differences. And that was the time where Pastor Dave told me about Billy Graham's sermons being printed in the newspapers. The idea of a sermon being in something like the New York Times is something I don't think I will ever truly comprehend, mostly because of when I was born. It's something that I've always felt of being a minority in our culture as a Christian. And I know some of you have lived through that in ways that I haven't. But it's that idea where how do we live, in some sense, like most Christians throughout history and around the world? How do we live when not only are we truly in a minority, but we feel it every day, where it is undeniable in every way? How do we live in a world when our worldview which was at least mirrored by past generations? How do we live when our worldview moves farther and farther away from our neighbors? How do we live in a world that feels increasingly more antagonistic to Jesus and the Bible? Today we're going to look at what is probably a familiar passage to many of you, where Paul talks about the armor of God. And using metaphors from the battlefield, Paul is going to finish the book of Ephesians with a battle cry to persevere in our faith while at the same time reaching out to the lost. How do we live when the community in which we live can feel like a spiritual battlefield. What will happen when we face adversity for our faith, yet knowing we are not helpless in the fight? So as we look at this passage at the end of Ephesians chapter 6, I'm going to look at the text in four parts. Number one, we're going to see commands to stand firm and what it means to engage in spiritual battle. Secondly, we're going to see a description of the armor of God. Three, we're going to see commands to pray and witness as the concrete expressions of this battle. And finally, fourth, we're going to see Paul's closing words to the Ephesians in this letter. So let's look at what it means to stand firm in the battle in verses 10 to 13 of chapter 6. Follow along as I read. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all this, to stand firm. As you probably noticed, Paul begins this part of the passage with the word finally. He has one last thing to say that is both the culmination of all that he has written and a final word to them as they finish the letter and head back out into the world part summary, and part halftime speech. Now, because of that, throughout this passage, I want to be referencing parts of these verses that point back to earlier in the book so you can see the continuity. But let's look at Paul's first command, is that the Ephesians be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. When we are in a world full of apathy and hostility to the gospel, we need to stand strong. But notice that we are not just strong in ourselves. 
but we are strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. This takes us back to Ephesians chapter 1, verse 19. And what is the immeasurable greatness of his power toward us who believe, according to the working of his great might? And Paul's prayer in Ephesians chapter 3, verse 16, that according to the riches of his glory, he may grant you to be strengthened with power through his spirit in your inner being. Our strength is in our relationship to God. Which leads to this second command, put on the whole armor of God. Now, we're going to look at more of this as we examine each piece of this armor in verses 14 to 17, but by way of summary, let me say a few things. Number one, the picture is of a person preparing for battle. When we live out our faith in the world, it is not easy and it can be a battle. But secondly, we do not battle like the world does. We wear God's armor because, three, ultimately this is a spiritual battle. We're told that we put the armor of God on so that we, quote, may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. In this, I want us to see that the way our battle is described, to stand against. I don't know if this is what we normally think of when we think of fighting, Or battling, but the dominant description of spiritual warfare in this text is these standing words. So stand against, withstand, or to stand firm that run throughout this part of the passage. Much of what we perceive as spiritual warfare, we should picture as endurance or perseverance in doing what is right and good. But secondly, we also need to see that Paul clarifies on who our true enemy is. We are to stand against the schemes of the devil. As was alluded to in chapter 2 of this book, our war is with the prince of the power of the air. Paul continues this in verse 12 by telling us what our warfare is not. We do not wrestle against flesh and blood. I think we need to pause to understand the life of Paul and the weight of him saying this. Paul was very mistreated by many people in many of the cities he went to. We've we've gone through the book of Acts. You see what happened. He endured mobs and imprisonments. And this guy, who went through so much at the hands of people who rejected the gospel... He tells us that the people who did that to him are not the real enemies. It's a powerful testimony as to what our fight truly is. We fight against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. We fight differently. Our battle is different. But we also must understand that these same forces with which we do battle have already been conquered. Ephesians 1, beginning in verse 20. That God seated Christ at his right hand in the heavenly places, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion, and above every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the age to come. And he put all things under his feet. In one sense, our battle is a battle that is already won. And as we endure in this life, we look forward to the day when that victory is fully consummated when Christ returns. But in that time between the already and the not yet, the time in between Christ's ascension and his return, We must be prepared for spiritual battle for which we need the whole armor of God. For a spiritual battle, you need spiritual armor. Again, Paul continues, We take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand firm. 
When we put on God's armor, we are able to withstand the attacks of the devil, which are the results of living in a fallen and sinful world, that evil day. There's a consistency here with how Jesus spoke of the time between his resurrection and his return. Listen to Matthew chapter 24. Then they will deliver you up to tribulation and put you to death, and you will be hated by all nations for my sake. And then many will fall away and betray one another and hate one another. And many false prophets will arise and lead many astray. And because lawlessness will be increased, the love of many will grow cold. But the one who endures to the end will be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom will be proclaimed throughout the whole world as a testimony to all nations, and then the end will come. The time in which we live between the return of Christ, between the re resurrection and the return of Christ, will be one that does include hardship, false teachers, and the need to endure. But as Paul calls us to, we are to withstand and stand firm even in those times. And because of the victory of Jesus that he secured through his death and resurrection, we can have confidence to resist the devil and persevere in godliness. Yet in one sense, the war is already won. And it's at this point that Paul takes these commands to stand firm and to endure and moves to extend this metaphor of armor to explain our spiritual battle. So as we look at these verses, again, when you think of a list, as you go through the individual parts of the list, you also need to think of the list as a whole. And there's a pattern that I think we see in the different uh, individual parts of this armor. That what is listed here is both what we have, but also what we do. So let's look at these in part. Let's look at verse 14. Stand therefore, having fastened on the belt of truth. The belt of truth. First of all, we have this. In God's word. God has revealed his truth to us in the Bible. Think of when Jesus was tempted by Satan in the wilderness. What did he do in response? He quoted the scriptures. When we face temptation, when we face the risk of being deceived, we can stand firm because we have Jesus' truth with us. But again, not only is this something we have, but this is something we do. We have the truth in God's word, but what do we do? We speak the truth. We've seen this before, and we'll come back to these verses again. In chapter 4, verse 15, we speak the truth in love. In verse 25 of that chapter, we speak the truth with our neighbors. We both have the truth in the word of God, by which we can defend ourselves from deception and temptation, but we also go out speaking the truth to others that they would be saved. And not only do we have the truth, but we have righteousness. Again, verse 14. Stand therefore, having fastened on the belt of truth and having put on the breastplate of righteousness. How do we have righteousness? Through faith in Jesus, we are given his righteousness. Those who were unrighteous were made righteous by God. And when we are made righteous, we live a life of righteousness, of following Jesus and the life of righteousness that he lived. Again, how does this fit into this idea of spiritual warfare? Every action we commit should be an action of righteousness. When we are tempted to sin, it's one thing to avoid that, but as we know with so many things in our lives, it's not just enough not to do something. You need to replace it with something else. And so when we are tempted to sin, 
We are to reject that sin, but then we are to put in that place a life of righteousness and justice. Again, this calls us back to Ephesians 4, verse 24, and to put on the new self created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. Persevering in a righteous life is a part of our spiritual battle. This leads to the next piece of armor, the shoes of peace. Verse 15, and as shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of of peace. Using the put picture of footwear used in combat back then, Paul tells them to put on the shoes that represent the gospel of peace. This is a theme that has run throughout the book of Ephesians. That our salvation in Christ is put in terms of peace. So Ephesians chapter 2 verses 15 and 16 by abolishing the law of commandments expressed in ordinances, that he might create in himself one new man in place of the two, so making peace, and might reconcile us both to God in one body through the cross, thereby killing the hostility. Through faith in Jesus, we have peace with God, peace with others, and peace within ourselves. And when I have peace with God, I can endure the attacks of the devil because I know that my relationship with God is secure. And because of that peace, I can experience inner peace, which helps me in this spiritual battle because sometimes we are most susceptible to attack when we do not have peace, but rather feel fear and stress. But again, peace is not just something we have. Peace is something we do. We engage in the spiritual battle by sharing the message of peace with others. That others can have peace with God through faith. But that also the reconciling power of the gospel that unites people who are so different and have so many areas of conflict. We are peacemakers. As Paul said early in the book, that we're eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bonds of peace. We not only have peace with Jesus, we are peacemakers in our lives. Next, we see the shield of faith. Verse 16, in all circumstances, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one. Our faith in Jesus is like a shield. Scholars help us to understand that the shield in mind here is the one that the armies of that day used that would cover an entire person. So don't just think a small little round shield. Think one that was covered an entire person. And that Paul extends this metaphor in that faith protects us by which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one. In this, the attacks of Satan are compared to flaming arrows. So how does, God, how does faith in Jesus act like a shield? A couple ways. Through faith, we are saved by grace, and therefore we cannot lose. Any attack by the devil cannot harm us because our salvation and eternal life is secure. Faith also acts like a shield in that it allows us to persevere through attack. When I trust God in that daily sense of the word, that even when I am under attack, I can trust that he will never leave me and that he will provide for me. I'm reminded of the words from Psalm 118, verse 6, The Lord is on my side. I will not fear. What can man do to me? When every day of my life is lived out in the trust of God, I will not fall under the attack. And I will persevere and do what is right. The next piece of armor here is the helmet of salvation. Verses 
Verse 17, and take the helmet of salvation. One of the major themes of Ephesians is the security of our salvation. So in chapter 1, verse 4, we read that we were chosen before the foundation of the world. And in chapter 2, we learn that we were not saved on the basis of our performance, but by the grace of God. Our salvation is a defense against attack because similarly, as we saw before, if we are saved, then we have nothing to fear. In Matthew 10, verse 28, And do not fear those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul. Rather, fear him who can destroy both soul and body in hell. In Romans 8, 31 to 32, What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? We can stand firm under any attack because our salvation is secure in Christ. And we also engage in battle when we take that salvation to the world. As we'll come back to in a little bit in a couple of verses. We are not defenseless. We can endure, but we also have a mission to spread the gospel. That is the offensive part of our battle. And when we understand the security of our salvation, when we understand we don't need to live in fear, we can freely share the gospel with those around us. Because as we'll come back to in a little bit, in one sense, we're not in this battle to win, but to cause all the soldiers from the other side to be on our side. (laughs) It's one great way to win a war. Get all the enemy soldiers to be on your team. Let's look at the last piece of armor here, the sword of the Spirit. Verse 17, and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Compared to a sword, we have at our disposal the Word of God, which is given to us by the Spirit. 2 Peter 1, verse 21, for no prophecy was ever produced by the will of man, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. We are not defenseless. But we must recognize that the other weapons of war in our world are not sufficient for our battle. We fight with the word of God. This does not mean yelling Bible quotes at people, but rather it means speaking the truth from the word of God. I want to highlight here a temptation to use the weapons of this world to fight in this spiritual battle. But especially here and with the other pieces of armor described, I want you to see an otherworldly battle. A battle description that would confuse an unbeliever. Because according to the rules of our world, this type of battling should never work. Living a righteous life sharing the word of God, having faith in God to an unbelieving world is silly. But this is what we are called to. We are to stand in righteousness. We are to pursue peace and love. We are to share the gospel of salvation with the world. We are to, as we'll see in the next verses here, pray, preach, and persevere. Let's look at these next verses, 18 to 20. Praying at all times in the Spirit with all prayer and supplication. To that end, keep alert with all perseverance, making supplication for all the saints. 
And also for me, that words may be given to me in opening my mouth boldly to proclaim the mystery of the gospel, for which I am an ambassador in chains, that I may declare it boldly as I ought to speak. There are three actions given primacy in this part of the passage that help us to understand concretely what spiritual battling looks like for us. And those three are pray, preach, and persevere. Let's first look there at pray. Verse 18, praying at all times in the Spirit with all prayer and supplication. To that end, keep alert with all perseverance, making supplication for all the saints. With all that repetition in that first verse there, it is clear that the dominant weapon of war that we have in our spiritual battle is prayer. We are to pray at all times in the Spirit. Our prayer must be regular, and we must not neglect the gift of prayer. When it says all prayer in supplication, it is referring to prayers for requests and also prayers for intercession for others and ourselves. This fits with what's found in the next verse of Paul encouraging them to pray for all the saints and for himself. But Paul also speaks to the manner of prayers. We are to pray in the Spirit. What does that mean? It means this, that our prayers are empowered by the Spirit of God who intercedes to the Father for us. I want you to notice this subtle theme that runs underneath. That so much of our victory is not actually based on us. (laughs) That even the warfare we engage in in prayer... Even that prayer is prayed in the Spirit. Our strength is in the Lord. Romans 8, 26, Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness, for we do not know what to pray as we ought, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. It's in this understanding of praying in the Spirit that Paul calls us to keep alert with all perseverance in our prayers. Again, using this military metaphor, we're helped by thinking of the soldier who's placed on guard duty. It doesn't matter how good of a fighter he is if he's asleep when the enemy comes. We must be alert to the realities of spiritual warfare and to persevere in our alertness. When we pray, we are engaging in spiritual battle. Paul then moves to prayer for himself, and in his prayer request, we see that next action of prayer, and that is to preach. Look at the content of Paul's prayer request, that words may be given to me in opening my mouth boldly to proclaim the mystery of the gospel. And later in verse 20, that I may declare it boldly as I ought to speak. First of all, we should find some comfort in that even the Apostle Paul needed help to boldly speak to people about Jesus. Secondly, we need to see that this is the other primary action of spiritual warfare, which is gospel witness. As I alluded to earlier, what better way to win a war than to convert the other side to your side? But this is another reminder of what was said earlier, that unbelievers are not the true enemy. But we are called to evangelize them with the gospel. We need to notice that spiritual warfare is not necessarily winning a debate or owning someone online, as so many YouTube and social media posts proclaim. We battle through sharing the good news of Jesus Christ who saves sinners. And this idea of spiritual battle through witnessing is not just here. It is a theme that runs throughout the book of Revelation. Let me give you one example from Revelation chapter 12. And they have conquered him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. For they love not their lives even unto death. We don't battle the way the world does. We do battle by sharing the love of Jesus and his death and resurrection. 
And the final action that I want to point out in this part of the passage is the idea of perseverance. And this is really in the background of this entire text. But I think it's important to give it its own space in our understanding of what we are to do in spiritual battle. We see it first in all the standing verbs that I pointed out in the first part of the passage and perseverance as mentioned here. That we are called to faithful endurance in following Jesus. We battle the spiritual forces of this world when we endure in our obedience to Jesus and when we stand firm on the truth. There is an ordinary faithfulness that God calls us to do regardless of what is going on around us. And I think this is important because we can faithfully persevere no matter what is going on around us. When everything else in your life feels out of control, you can control how you live. No matter how, thing, how chaotic or how wicked things are around me, I can faithfully persevere and follow Jesus. And when we're under stressful situations, it's so important to focus on what can I actually change and do. You can always stand firm. No matter what is going on around, that is always in your control. Sometimes I think we look down upon this because it feels too ordinary and we want the glitz and the glamour, whatever that looks like in our lives. Whether that's the big crowds or the big followings or whatever it is. But central to spiritual warfare central to battling against the schemes of the devil is ordinary, normal endurance in following Jesus. And you can do that any day. And it's what God is calling you to do. Don't despise it because of its ordinariness, but actually live it out. We fight our spiritual battles through prayer, preaching, and perseverance. Let me close quickly here with a couple remarks on the last verses of the book. This is verses 21 to 24. Verse 21, so that you know how I am and what I am doing, Tychicus, the beloved brother and faithful minister in the Lord, will tell you everything. I have sent him to you for this very purpose, that you may know how we are and that he may encourage your hearts. Paul ends the letter by talking about Tychicus. Tychicus is a respected part of Paul's missionary team. He's called a beloved brother and faithful minister. He is also most likely the one who carried the letter to Ephesus and is currently reading it. He was sent to to give them the letter and to let them know how Paul and the rest of the team are doing. And he's doing this for the purpose that he may encourage their hearts. It's good for us to be reminded that Paul was not some lone ranger missionary. And we also see the good relationship between his team and the local church. We love to hear from our supported missionaries because it is a great source of encouragement that God is at work across the world and connects us to that work And this leads to Paul's final words. He ends with sort of a blessing benediction in verses 23 and 24. Peace be to the brothers and love with faith from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace be with you all who love our Lord Jesus Christ with love incorruptible. He blesses them for God to give them peace, grace, and love with faith. And again, as you read and you go back through the book of Ephesians, you see these flow throughout the the letter. That through faith in Jesus and by his grace, we have peace with God and one another. And we are to live our lives of faith following Jesus with love of God, love of our fellow believers, and love of our neighbors. We are to rejoice in the grace that we have received and share that grace with the world.
And in the last words, we see that the believers are described as all who love our Lord Jesus Christ with love incorruptible. Our brothers and sisters in Christ are known for their undying and never-ending love for Jesus that works itself out in every aspect of our lives. A couple thoughts as we close this morning. Number one, Christians live in the reality of spiritual warfare. We must be alert to these realities. It also means that we do not wage war with the same weapons of this world. It also means that even those who might persecute us are not the real enemies, but we fight against them by fighting for them with the gospel and love of Jesus. Secondly, our battle tactics are prayer, preaching, and perseverance. It's significant here that the actions that this text call for are for regular prayer, preaching the gospel, and persevering in following Jesus. We must be a people of prayer. One thing that you might consider on your way out is Ray, who's the free church pastor down in Redmond, made this prayer guide that I've made copies for uh, over where you got the bulletins. I'll put those out after service. But it's a prayer guide that takes you through regular prayer. It's a 40-day challenge, but you could use this in your regular prayer days. But it utilizes both the armor of God here and the Lord's Prayer. Again, we need to be people of prayer, and sometimes we need structure to help us actually do it, right? Because we know we need to, but do we actually do it? So I'm going to make these available for you to check out if that would be helpful to you. We need to be preachers of the gospel. We must view the unbelievers around us not as the enemies, but as the captives in need of freedom. We must be lovingly bold in sharing our, the gospel of Jesus Christ. And we must be engaged in the ordinary faithfulness of perseverance. Much of the Christian life is that ordinary faithful endurance. We must continue to do what is right and good regardless of what is going on around us. And finally, let me say this. We need to love Jesus with love incorruptible. Keep your relationship with Jesus the first priority. When we do that, all the other priorities in our life will fall into their proper place. And that love incorruptible, love Jesus with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and follow him in every aspect of your life. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for your word that we would keep alert and be ready to do battle against the prince of the power of the air, that we would persevere in faithfulness to you, that we would be people of regular prayer, and that we would be ready to lovingly and boldly preach the good news of Jesus Christ. That you would empower us by your spirit to follow the word you've given us, and that we would be engaged in your work in this world, ready and prepared. And that we would follow you with love incorruptible and love you with everything that we are. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks for watching this video from Hillside Evangelical Free Church. Our hope is that these resources will help you grow as a fully devoted follower of Jesus Christ. We're located in Green Bank, Washington on Whidbey Island. And if you live in the area and are looking for a church home, we'd love to have you join us. You can find out more information at our website at hillside-efc.com.